Philippians chapter 4 this morning, and in fact, we may spend more than a Sunday or two in that particular chapter. And just to give a brief bit of context, Philippians, the letter uh, to the Christians at Philippi, is considered by most to probably be Paul's most positive, affirming letter in all of the New Testament. You know, many times Paul had some very hard things, tough things uncomplimentary things to say to faith communities. The Corinthian correspondence is an example of that. But yet when we get to Philippians, you can just tell that this is a faith community that, that Paul believes in so many ways is hitting on all cylinders and it's just positive. It's about joy, it's about rejoicing and, and about having joy as believers. And so we're gonna we're gonna kind of look at uh, the opening verses of chapter 4 this morning. And so uh, Paul writes, he says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Sinti to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my loyal yo fellow, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And again, you can just kind of, just, just sense from just those verses there in the fourth chapter, just the kind of the positive and the, the upbeat tone and tenor. Of, uh, of this letter. In fact, Ken Ball says about Philippians, he says, it's Paul's personal manifesto on, him, on how to live a life full of joy. And when you look at the book of Philippians, the letter of Philippians, in its breadth, there are really two faith convictions overall that are woven throughout all of that letter. There are two faith convictions which are the basis for that joy. It is the sovereignty of God and the hope of heaven. The sovereignty of God and the hope of heaven. And the way I kind of look at that is the sovereignty of God is that which is a source, the source of joy in the present, in the here and the now, and the hope of heaven is that ultimate joy that you and I have in the future. But woven throughout Philippians are these two faith convictions that are foundational to Paul's thinking about what does it mean to have joy? What does it mean to rejoice? What does it mean to have the peace, as he says there in verse 7, that passes all understanding? Well, what I want to do with chapter 4 this morning is I want to look at, and again, I, I think we're going to spend maybe another Sunday or two in this, in this chapter. What I want to do this morning is to look at some things that Paul reminds us of here, very practical, very pragmatic, that are barriers, that are barriers to experiencing joy, to having the peace that passes all understanding. Some of them are stated overtly, some of them are implied, but I want to just take three this morning that are things that Paul lists here in this chapter that if we're not careful, they're, man, they're going to stand in the way of you and I having a life of joy. The first one is resolve conflict. You know, it's going to be really hard for you and I to have lives of joy and to have lives of peace if there is unresolved conflict in our lives. I think, it's, I think it's so interesting that, that Paul here points to an unresolved conflict within the Philippian community. And so there in verse 2, he, he talks about and he names two ladies that are in the congregation that obviously something has come up that has put them in conflict with each other. We have no idea what it is. Paul doesn't say, doesn't go into any details, doesn't go into any specifics, which is an indication that 
the Philippian congregation was probably aware of what it was. And thus he doesn't need to go into a lot of a lot of detail here. But he asked these two ladies and he asked others to help that they might be reconciled. And the interesting thing is that in these two ladies, Paul does not indicate that, that they're like bad people. Right? In fact, he says these two ladies have contended for the gospel with me at my side. Their names are written in the book of life. And so he is highly complimentary of them and their service and their ministry and the encouragement that each of them has provided to him in his own ministry. So I want to just say that because there is conflict doesn't mean that you and I are bad people. Good people, believers, can have conflict. So we understand, however, that when that is unresolved, and that's just going to be an impediment to you and I having a life of joy and a life of peace. The Denver Institute of Faith uh, in Colorado does a lot of, they see as their mission, conflict mediation. And, uh, and on their website, uh, they take the teachings of Jesus and they give three initial steps that uh, are asked to be taken if we are serious about being reconciled to someone else. So I want, I want to just give you these three real quick. They're not in your, in your, in your worship guide. They're not one of the fill in the blanks. I, I got a little tight on space this week. So, but the three steps are number one, self-reflection. Again, all this is grounded in the teachings of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus makes the statement. He says, you know, before you start looking at the speck in your brother's eye, you need to deal with the plank in your own. So the first step to conflict resolution, to reconciliation, is, is we have to self-assess. We have to reflect upon ourselves before we do anything else. Secondly, is then to initiate reconciliation. To initiate reconciliation. And you know, what happens so many times you know, it's the old self just getting in the way of the new self. What happens so many times when there's a conflict, we just say, well, you know, they got to come to me. Yeah, she needs to call me. Well, he needs to make the first move. You know what? Jesus never called that when it came to reconciliation. He said, you initiate reconciliation. And one of the passages where he says that, and there are many, but one of them is Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus tells the story about the man who comes into the temple. He's going to present a gift at the altar, and he has a conflict with the brother. And Jesus says, you know what? Before he presents that gift at the altar, he needs to leave, go, reconcile himself to his brother. Then he can come back and present the gift at the altar. Initiate reconciliation. And then the third step is sometimes we just need assistance in peacemaking. We need assistance in, in peacemaking. And, uh, and so in Matthew chapter 18, again, the teachings of Jesus are that, you know, take, if you need, if you need to, take a, a brother or sister or two or three with you and let them be a part of the mediation process. But Jesus often talked about conflict resolution. Jesus often talked about reconciliation. And, and Paul does it here in Philippians chapter 4 as he talks about these, these two ladies. Let me just give you, and this is in your bulletin, let me just give you three questions that we ought to always ask. We can kind of stretch these out a little bit that, uh, that particularly when there is conflict within the body of Christ, and that's really what Paul was talking about here in Philippians 4, but we kind of, we kind of push them out a, a little bit. There ought to be three questions that we ought to ask ourselves before we get all churned up and someone else. Number one, is this a matter of eternal significance? Is this a matter of eternal significance? You know, a lot of times as believers, a lot of times as Christians, man, we can get wrapped around the scope of something that has no eternal significance. Is this a matter of eternal significance? We want to push that out a little bit. We can, we can ask ourselves, is this a matter of ultimate significance? Number 
two, is this a matter of biblical conviction? You know, there are points, I want you to understand that when Paul talks about reconciliation and, and conflict resolution, he doesn't mean that we just kind of just gloss over everything. There are moments in Scripture from Paul's writings where Paul says, you know what? There cannot be reconciliation and this person needs to be put out of the body. So I don't want you to think Paul is Pollyanna about this kind of thing. But there are points and moments in Scripture where Paul will say because somebody is a, just a complete divisive source within the body of Christ or because of someone's behavior, what you know what? They need to step out. They need to step out. It was a matter of biblical conviction. We ought to ask ourselves that question. Is, it, is this a matter of personal conviction for me? Third, is it a matter upon which Christians must agree? Again, Paul is talking back here, conflict within the body of Christ, within the Christian community. Is this a matter upon which Christians must agree? Let me give you, let me give you an example. Um, I believe scripturally, uh, a topic upon which Christians must agree is the Trinity. So if, if, if one does not hold to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to say from a biblical perspective, I don't really think you can claim to be a Christian. I believe that's something upon which all Christians must agree. The method of baptism is not. Method of baptism is not. Sprinkling versus immersion versus when and so on and so forth. Good Christians can disagree on that and still be brothers and sisters in, in Jesus Christ. So I would just suggest to you, based upon Scripture, I think these are three good questions to ask in this matter of resolving conflict. You know what? If, if the issue doesn't rise to any of those levels, I don't think it's really worth getting upset. It's got to rise to a pretty significant level. But resolve conflict. Number number two. Number two. Paul says, rejoice always. When you and I are not people of rejoicing, when you and I are not people of praise, I'm going to tell you it's going to be really hard to be and to have a life of joy and a life of peace. And so Paul says there in verse 4, he says twice, in fact, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice basically is the actioning of joy. Joy is the noun. Rejoice is the verb form of that noun. C.S. Lewis in his book Reflections on the Psalms talked about one of the ways in which you and I rejoice is Praise. It's to praise. It's to praise God. And uh, C.S. Lewis wrote in that wonderful book, he said, Praise is, quote, the inner spiritual health made audible. Praise is you and I giving full expression of the Spirit to God. I think it's a wonderful definition of what praise is. Someone took Psalm 100, which is about praise, and they just broke it down, and they said, when you look at Psalm 100, you see four powerful truths about praise, which again is a, is a way in which you and I can rejoice. I want to just share those with you briefly this morning. Number one is that when you and I rejoice, when we praise, we have a greater experience of God. We have a greater experience of God. In fact, Scripture says God inhabits the praise of His people. When you and I praise, collectively and individually, it just gives us a better, broader, deeper, richer experience of the presence of God. Secondly, when you and I praise, when we rejoice, it changes us. It transforms us. It does something within us that makes us better. Third, praise is based in relationship, not ritual. Again, it's all from Psalm 100. It's written down. You know, me and I, we put together a worship service, right? You come in every Sunday morning, and we 
we stand and we sing some opening songs, we have special music and, and all of that kind of thing. That's to help us praise, but praise is not just simply going through the motion of coming to church and just singing a few songs and just being here. What we do in worship should be an outward expression of a powerful inner relationship that you have with God. We're just giving you the vehicle to make that happen. To allow that to be the outflow and the overflow of who and what you are in relationship to God on the inside. So praise is, is not about ritual. Praise is about relationship. And then fourth and finally, praise is an armor against the negative. You know what? If you and I are people of praise, as believers, if we're people of praise, it's going to be really difficult to be negative. To just have a negative aspect, to be a negative person when you and I are people of praise. If you and I are people of praise, I would suggest to you, we, we actually have to like work at it to be a negative person. I mean, praise is the vaccine against negativity. Praise is the prescription for joy and for peace that passes all understanding. And so Paul says, I say to you, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. And then the third and final thing is, there in verse 5, and I phrased it this way, reject unreasonableness. Reject unreasonableness. And the reason I say that is that in verse 5, Paul writes, let your gentleness, and another translation of that word is reasonableness. Let your gentleness, again, your translation may say reasonableness, be evident to all. Let your gentleness be evident to all. I, I just want to say to you this morning that when we look at the word gentleness, um, Gentleness in, in the New Testament is described as a fruit of the Spirit, a sign of the Spirit in one's life, which tells me that gentleness, real gentleness, true gentleness is supernatural. Because left to our own devices, left to our own natural inclinations, we really are not gentle people. And so when the Bible says something is a fruit of the Spirit, or a gift of the Spirit, or a sign of the Spirit, you know immediately, okay, it's not natural to have that, it's supernatural to be gifted that. Because left to our own natural devices, you know, what we want to do, you know, how many of you have ever thought, I know I've thought this from time to time, the old self gets in the way again of the, of, of the new self, and uh, we say, well, you know what, I'm just going to call and give them a piece of my mind. Someone, someone once said, those who are always wanting to give others a piece of their mind are the ones who can least afford to give away a piece of their mind. I think it's true. But left to our own devices, we kind of want to assert ourselves and go boldly and march in there and just tell people off and give people a piece of our mind and, and tell them what's what and set them straight. And... Uh, says in Philippians 4, 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. For me, gentleness sometimes means employing, thinking, three magic words. Remember, I'm giving you the questions about, you know, something got to rise to the really significant level. Eternal significance, biblical conviction, right? Three magic words sometimes, and you and I are to have joy in peace. Let it go. You know. I want to conclude with a little humorous illustration. When I was a pastor 25, 27 years ago, and another 
the church at the funeral home, one of the funeral homes, can't even remember which one it was over in Salem, called me and uh, asked if I could come and, and do a funeral. And uh, the family was kind of from out of town. The deceased really didn't have a church connection, and, and they, you know, they, they needed a minister to come to a funeral. And so anyway, I remember telling the funeral director at the funeral, I said, I would be more than happy to, to help out. And so I got in touch with the family, and uh, we met, kind of, kind of put, put, put a service together. And um, anyway, <clears throat> I believe it was the, it was one of the parents, but I believe it was the, the mother that had passed away. Huge Elvis Presley fan. Huge Elvis Presley fan. Loved his music, loved his singing, and and so the family said, Nelson, you know, um, like to have some traditional hymns played on the organ, you know, at the beginning, and some traditional hymns played on the organ, you know, at the end of the service. You know, one of mom's favorite songs, and I think it was she, she was with it, and so it was she and her husband's favorite song was that. You know, old Elvis Presley thing. And, Wise men say only fools rush in. Hold your applause, please. I, I, know, I know you wanted to. I know you wanted to. Hold that. But you, I don't know what the title of that song is, but you're, but you're with me. We want that play. You know, on a cassette, you know, as a tape of Elvis singing it. During the service. Now, I'll remind you, did this 25, 27 years ago, when something like that was a little bit of the exception, today it's, you know, today, you know. So I said, okay, all right. So anyway, so we, you know, the day of the service rolls around, and I walk in and greet the family and head on back to the music, music room where there's the organist. Fit to be tied. So she's playing like what a friend we had in Jesus on the on the organ, and while she's playing, she pivots to me, and I'm sitting there in a chair and waiting on the service to you know kind of get started, and, and she says, "Do you know what they want played during the service?" And I said, "Yeah, I said Elvis. I did not sing it before. I could tell we were not in that kind of an atmosphere." I said, "Right, that Elvis, you know," and she goes, "Well, you." Being a minister of the gospel, you need to go set them straight. You need to go talk to them. We need to take care of this. I declined her invitation, but I remember I looked at her. I had no idea who, who, who she was. And I said, you know, I think this is one of these occasions where we just need to, you can say it with me, Let your gentleness be evident to all, Paul says. Someone put it this way. When you and I are gentle, we show up as grace. It's a really good piece. All in service to you and I having a life of joy and peace. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that we can open up your word. Lord, learn from it, apply it to our lives, grow. And today we 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 open up from Philippians chapter four. Just allow them. Spirit inspired words of Paul to wash over us and just remind us of some things about what it means in a practical, pragmatic sense to move us into lives that are marked by joy and peace. And so, Lord, may we be people who are about reconciliation. May we be people of praise and rejoicing because there's power in praise. Lord, may, may we reject unreasonableness. 
When we show up, may grace show up so that our gentleness will be evident to all. And Lord, we just, we just pray that you will help us to do those things so that we might know the joy that is in you and the peace that transcends what we can even begin to understand. In Jesus' name we pray.